All right, we are back uh, to our API Days New York event. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Vincenzo Gianese. I work for Stoplight, an API company, and today I'm going to be your MC for the rest of the conference. Uh, Jack had to had to go for personal endeavors, so I'm going to be replacing him, and you're also going to be see me tomorrow for the rest of the conference. And just for a word, in case you're asking yourself, you should really shake. I totally agree with you. I had my appointment, but it was. Uh, I couldn't do it. And tomorrow is going to be the same. So better bet these two. With that out of the way, our first speaker for uh, for the first session it's uh, it's going to be from the wow the CEO of Moesif, Derek Gilling. We also actually even found out that we had a kind of a little collaboration in the past for some software that I wrote, and he's going to be talking about how to make your AI platform easy for the developers to adopt. So Derek, uh, the stage is yours. And I'm getting out of the way and uh, enjoy the the session. Cool. No, really. Th uh, thanks for uh, having the opportunity here to uh, talk about how to actually make your API platform easy to adopt. Uh, before jumping into it, just a little background on myself. Um, you know, I'm the CEO of Mosef, which is a, a user centric API analytics platform, and I like to focus on everything from developer platform strategy to KPIs, growth. But a little other thing about me is uh, I love IPAs. Um, I don't know if uh, the pandemic has decreased or increased that uh, drinking levels, but uh, what's the, what else do you do at home? But jumping into it, why is it so hard to get developers to adopt a platform? Well, usually there's no developer single persona, uh, but they're also skeptical. You know, they're not uh, uh, ready to go look into your marketing materials, your sales mater materials, and that type of stuff. And they really don't like enjoying integration work. When you uh, get started with a new API, you know, a lot of times, you know, the first few uh, uh, um, uh, pieces that they have to do is actually integrate with your API. Um, also, of course, there are other tasks that they have on their plate, uh, or they just may have some political uh, situations where, you know, their manager says you should build this here rather than adopting a third-party API. But what do I mean by different developer personas? Well, let's say you're, you're a billing platform, you're a billing API, and you're trying to find the billing guru at every SaaS company out there. Well, there's thousands of different languages and frameworks when it comes to API developers or, or just developers in general. You have embedded software engineers, folks who like C++, then you have your, your more Jamstack focused, Node.js, Python, that type of stuff. The other big piece that a lot of folks forget is there's different levels of experience in education. Not everyone started off with a computer science background. You know, not everyone started off, you know, learning web technologies or Node.js. And so how do you make sure you can adjust your customer journey or the developer journey to accommodate for these different developer personas? And lastly, this is probably the hardest thing to really think about is, you know, selling to a developer or getting a developer to adopt your platform there's still a lot of elements that seem similar to enterprise sales. You have legal and security review, you have project priorities, and more importantly, you have different decision makers that are all usually after different goals than what the developer is looking for themselves. So how do you think about this holistically? Well, I personally like to start with the developer funnel. This gives you a full map of, you know, where are the key obstacles, when someone is uh, uh, going through your developer docs, looking at your API platform, going through the onboarding flows, and figuring out where they drop off. So for example, you might have a developer funnel where it's initial list uh, visit to a, a doc page, your landing page, then they move to sign up, right? That's great, you got someone to sign up, but then what? You know, How do you get them to these next two steps, which is what I call first hello world and first working app? And there's a few different uh, terms for these, but these are the big things that you really want to drive folks to because that's when they start to see real value from your platform. Before that, they just signed up and were just poking around, kicking the tires. And what to measure for a funnel like this, right? There's really two pieces. Conversion to next step. This is, uh, goes without saying for most developer funnels, sales funnels, marketing funnels included. But another key piece to this is the time to next step. Why is this the case? Well, a lot of times a developer can actually get stuck in the same uh, funnel stage for days or even weeks, right? If they don't have an SDK available, you know, to get integrate their platform, that they go build it themselves, 
you know, go on Stack Overflow, try and figure out what is it that it really takes to uh, adopt this API. And here's a, a, a real example funnel of, of what I like to uh, be tracking when it comes to an API. You have the three steps here. First one being sign up, which is step one. But then the second step is making that very first API call. In this case, you know, this API call is making a payment transaction. And they only needed to do it one time. Why only one time? Well, at least demonstrates that your, your API is pretty easy to use and that the developer probably wants to move forward with uh, uh, building out a full working app or test apparatus to prove value with your API platform. And that's coming up to this third step. Now what we're tracking is folks who made more than 100 payment transactions, and you set that within a, a certain time period, like in the last seven days, in the last day. But this is something that is providing value to the developer, but also they can show it off to their management team to, to legal team and other stakeholders that might ha have an influence on that developer. And I'm gonna take each one of these steps and break it down and what you can be doing to your API platform to increase those conversion rates. So let's talk about the first one, which is time to first hello world. What are the problems here? Usually you have a very ambiguous or lengthy onboarding process. Or big piece of what I've seen missing is there's no framework or SDK that's designed for their environment. And there's thousands of different languages out there, thousands of different environments. You can be using AWS versus Azure. A lot of times if you have just the API by itself without any you know, uh, additional levels on top of that, it's just gonna take those developers a lot longer to make that first API call, right? Lastly, just having outdated documentation you know, that does not match what your SDK actually provides is another blocker to getting to their first API call. How do you actually help this? Well, you can start off with uh, content that's really, really focused on education. You know, a lot of folks think about stuff like inbound marketing, they could be around blog posts, webinars, good documentation, uh, and, and each one of these areas can target different areas. For example, case studies might be focused on developers who already saw some initial value from your API, now they're trying to figure out, should they go with your platform or build it themselves? Whereas high level, you know, stuff like blogs and docs, that's just showing how easy is it to really get started with your platform. And this is why I talk about the sandbox stage. What we're really trying to do here is get developers to make the first hello world. Now, this is not something of value. They're not really, this is not measuring the time to value for your platform. What you're trying to show is, should I spend more time investing in this platform versus moving on to a next, next company or in-home grown solution uh, when it comes to uh, switching between different technologies? So we're trying to show is how long does it take for them to make the first API call that is just showing ease of use, right? You have up-to-date documentation. You have SDKs that support their platform or language. One way is to accelerate this time to first hello world is by having a very clean and small number of steps during the onboarding flow and, and make it personalized, right? So, you know, uh, personalize it to the SDK that they're looking at, their use case, and an easy way to do this is ask questions, like right when they first get started. You know, what is your main goal for adopting this API? Is it for a, a, a monitoring and visibility? Is it to have you know, a, a faster and, and, and more optimized search platform for e-commerce uh, uh, tool that they have? Uh, ask them what they're trying to do. And this can be done through uh, in-app surveys. It can be uh, done through follow-ups from uh, you know, someone from Cosmic Success or, or other team but just really getting to the root of why are they using this API? Because as all of us know, you can have a thousand different use cases for APIs that they may not really care about. But the other thing that people usually forget about is they drop the ball. What happens after sign up? Great, you, you, you show them your onboarding flow, you know, how to drop in your, your API key and SDK into their code to get started, but then what's next? And the biggest thing I recommend for anyone trying to make a, a platform easy to use is guide them, right? Really think about your customer journey on what emails they get, you know, seven days after sign up. In this case, what I'm showing is, you know, anyone that signed up within seven days, 
still hasn't seen any API calls yet. Uh, and, and the number of uh, purchase transactions is still zero in the last seven days. What we're gonna do is actually send them an email. Hey, it looks like you haven't got started yet, but you're looking at the you know, Node.js SDK. Here are some tips to get started with this uh, API. Focus on the very single use case, the very single value prop that gets them started. And then we can talk about the additional value they get from your API later on. Later on, then we talk about get them to a working app. What is a working app? That's when you're actually truly demonstrating value, some tangible value through your API. And this is something that that developer can show off to their uh, management team. They can show it off to the product manager that is in charge of, of setting these priorities. It's something that's tangible. You know, just making that first API call initially, that first API uh, uh, hello world through say Postman or another tool, that's only to demonstrate to the developer themselves that your platform is easy to work with. Now, when we talk about first working app, that's actually giving them, uh, you're empowering them to show to their other uh, stakeholders that are influencing these uh, developers' decisions. But what's slowing down time to first working app, or sometimes called time to first paid app? It's stuff like legal and compliance risk, project priorities, uh, maybe testing requirements. Uh, make sure it can scale within their platform, especially if it's going to impact any production infrastructure, which a lot of developer tools or API-first tools do. One way to go around this is by providing them, empowering your developers with tools that can do this automatically. So, for example, if GPR, GDPR and CCPA compliance is a risk, make sure you have endpoints available and clearly show how they can use these endpoints within their own systems, right? No one wants to uh, be caught off guard because this new platform they're adopting don't have these uh, uh, features already baked in. Another easy way, and this is one of my favorites, is having some type of API log, log it, or API audit log, debug logs embedded right inside the developer portal. As soon as a new developer is adopting your platform, they should be able to see you know, all the different API calls being made, which ones are failing, which ones are, are becoming successful, that way, when they do run into issue, it's literally one click for them to say, hey, I need uh, someone to take a look at this, right? How fast can your customer success team uh, uh, help on both these developers when they do run into issues? Similarly, providing things like uh, uh, testing frameworks, uh, you know, validating their integration. Is this uh, you know, all 100% OK? Or is there some area that they need to go take a look at that they may not even know themselves? And going back to the content strategy I talked about earlier, making sure it's personalized and relevant for them. You know, if, the, if they haven't integrated your API yet, why would you be talking about case studies and all these additional features you can do with your API if they haven't even got to the first point, right? And this is where you should really focus on driving developers to integrate your API. You know, why should they even test your platform, make a few API calls, and see how easy it is to use? Once they've done that, then they move to the text and sandbox stage. That's where they've made a few API calls, but they haven't seen the full value of why should they move with your platform versus someone else's. You could talk about this with you know, different use cases, uh, additional features they might want to test and explore, and also handle concerns around security and performance, because that might be top of mind, especially within banking and uh, uh, you know, the financial space, where those type of concerns are, are much more than you know, if you're building something that's in unregulated space. Finally, once they do deploy that uh, first working app, you know, the deal's not done, right? Now you might have to think about upsells or, or, or setting up a, a larger enterprise contract, you know, with that team. And this is where you start driving the value of your platform over homegrown solutions via case studies, comparison guides, you know, aim, uh, uh, basically enable your developer to be your champion and distribute those uh, materials to their management team and other folks. And this is why I call uh, you're selling through developers rather than just trying to sell to developers themselves. Because now what happens is you need that developer to be your champion to go to their VP engineering team. Why should we go with a solution? Similarly, go to business teams who might have concern about what does this cost? What's the ROI by going through with this platform? Is it going to have any lock-in that we're concerned about? Similarly, with leadership, 
you know, what do I get out of this, right? Is this something that is just purely an infrastructure problem or do I get any type of dashboards or analytics or other success material I can uh, um, help enable uh, uh, my reporting and, and bubble that up to uh, the C-suite? And how do you do this? We'll start building relationships with your developers. You know, set up something like a you know developer relations management stack. You know, this can be an existing CRM that you repurpose for developer relations. It could be a, a, a new tool that you can explore. And this is a way for you to track exactly all the different interactions a developer had with your API, everything from SDK they used, how long did it take for them to integrate to all the different API calls and, and maybe struggles. Like, do they have a high level of errors, unauthorized uh, 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 issues, that type of stuff. And once you're able, able to set that up, now you can reach out to them proactively. Are they using an outdated SDK? You know, are they uh, using something that's vulnerable? Make sure you're able to enable them to, to, not, to uh, sleep at night without having any concerns with its integration. You really just wanna show that your, your platform is developer friendly rather than something that a developer has to take uh, many different hoops to get this information, right? Make it automated. Every stuff, every, uh, leverage stuff like in-app notifications or emails. Now, there's one takeaway I really want to talk about uh, uh, during this talk. It's really focusing on the value that developers get from your API. Don't just focus on signups. Signups is still a vanity metric. It's great for marketing, but what you're really trying to do is get uh, developers to value as quick as possible. First, by showing how easy your uh, uh, develop, uh, API is to, uh, able to use. Then after that, showing, uh, giving them the tools so they can build a full solution on top of your API. And that's all I have. Is there any questions? Let me jump back to... Uh... All right, let's check it out. It seems like there are no questions here on the channel, although I have one, and it's kind of an inception. Sure. What are the metrics, the important metrics of a metric platform? The important metrics of a metric platform. Oh, that's <laughs> an interesting tongue yeah. twister. You know, for us, I mean, we are a metrics platform, and so we track most of these same things that you know any other API platform out there uh, uh, will use. For example. You know, we see a lot of folks who will set up most of and use it to automate a lot of these uh, uh, developer outreach emails, in-app guidance, but they don't log into most of itself, right? So, you know, tracking someone that signs into most of every day or every couple of days, you know, yes, that's a great metric. However, it's not really showing the value that they're getting out of it. So what we would rather track is, you know, how many different emails are they sending out to their developers? Were they able to, you know, act on those notifications and emails? You know, how much data are they sending? How many different APIs have they integrated most of with, right? And all this stuff happens on the API side rather than the, the UI side. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, then the second one, since, like, you know, you, you probably with your platform have a lot of data and understanding of the API, do you have any crazy thing that you've seen that you're like, whoa, why would you... Why would you even want to track that? Or maybe one of the metrics that, for example, in your opinion, apart from the sign up, doesn't really make any sense. So that's a good question. So one ha one thing that can happen is people go down vanity metrics of how many API transactions per customer is making. That is a, it is a great metric, right? You know, it can give you like high level, you know, um, perspectives on volume who is your largest customers. But what can also happen is, if you messed up on your pagination design? If you messed up where you're severely limiting the way that people can access your API, you're artificially pumping up those metrics, right? So you need to really think about this API call corresponds to this value, right? Whether that's value to your organization, such as, you know, this transaction is, is worth $2, or, you know, the, this customer was able to do this with your API, Tracking it from that perspective is, is far greater of a, of a success metric than just, hey, this customer made, you know, 5,000 API calls per day, right? Yeah. 
So I, I guess I guess one advice that we can give to the audience is instead of tracking the API calls per se, you may want to kind of design a use case that requires five API calls, you know, get a user that get the invoices and then get the product and then print the report. That's a use case and that's a metric you're striving for. Not just the, you know, the API call, but the whole use case scenario that might involve multiple API calls. Exactly. And, and one of the mistakes we've seen just uh, tracking API usage is stuff like health probes, right? Most folks that want to integrate an API, they may want to use your health probe. Hopefully you have that public. If you, if you don't, I highly recommend doing it uh, just because folks don't want surprises when they're using a new platform. Uh, but then again, that's you know artificially pushing up your API volume per customer. Um, so distilling that down to Hey, you know, uh, uh, making their first API call means making the first transaction, their payment transaction, you know, if you're Stripe. You know, if you're Twilio, maybe it's making the first SMS transaction through the platform. And then understanding what is that threshold for them to consider this uh, a true working app rather than just like one transaction through Postman. That might be, you know, 100 SMS messages sent through their API. It could be maybe 100 transactions or payment transactions, you know, sent through Stripe. And you may even want to break that down further to is it 100 payment transactions just from one user, which could be like a test account, or is it 100 payment transactions you know, spread across more than 10 users, right? Which may imply that they have other beta testers using this app that was built on top of Stripe. I think really thinking about what are those success uh, metrics and then mapping that out. Um, and then once you have that, then you explore it in many different ways. For example, you know, what marketing channels is actually driving you know, the high success metrics? Is it Reddit? Is it, you know, uh, paid ads? You know, is, is it SEO and content? Then drilling into which content pieces is it actually able to explain and, and educate your, your, your uh, developer community the most to get to those success metrics. All right. So uh, there are some questions for you, but I think responding to those one, it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little bit too much time. The only one that we can probably ask really quickly is, can you quickly talk about uh, how deeply does your platform integrate with Hubs HubSpot? You have two minutes, no more. Sure. Yeah. Um, we have a full HubSpot integration and what we've seen people do this for is they want to send emails like a full elaborate drip sequence from the API uses data. Right? So, you know, step one is, you know, you signed up in the last five days, but haven't sent any API traffic at all. Okay, you get one set of emails. Uh, step two, um, you integrate the API, you sent what I call that, that sandbox stage. You're kicking the tires, not really able to deploy like a full app yet, but you at least made a few, you know, a, a call through Postman. They get another set of uh, emails uh, through HubSpot. And you can break that down by role. Are they an engineer? Are they a product manager? Are they, you know, someone else that might be uh, uh, still a key stakeholder uh, investing in your platform? And of course, then you go beyond to the the, the uh, third levels, which is, hey, they're they're using your platform a lot. How do you make sure you can talk about the value that you bring to the organization through case studies? Um, this is the way you should be leveraging the platform and just getting them on a, a, a phone or a call. Talk to your developers. Talk to other folks that might be using your platform and make sure you can answer their questions. Right. They may not know about this cool feature or flow, and it's up to you to really uh, understand their pain points and what they're trying to achieve with your platform. But yeah, we have a, right. a native integration yeah, with the HubSpot, Salesforce, uh, Segment, a bunch of other tools like that. Nice. You know, everybody interested can check the platform. And also, just after the presentation, make sure to check the stage channel. There are some questions you might want to check it out, but they are just too long to respond. Uh, so. Thank you very much for being with us. Very good presentation. Um, and uh, again, check the channel and we'll move on with the next presentation. We're exactly in right on time. So we're going to be inviting the next speaker on the stage. Um,